But over the next two Sundays, what I want us to do as we prepare our hearts for the Easter weekend is I want to transport you to Easter Thursday night. And I want us to step into the courtroom of the most famous trial in all of history. Jesus on trial. And so before we gaze upon the horrors of the cross over the Easter weekend, we must stand with Christ in the dock. We must face the injustice that led him there. And we're gonna hear the trumped up verdict of people saying he is worthy of death. And then it's gonna break our hearts as we see our Lord led away to be crucified. Now on this Easter Thursday night, Peter followed his Lord at a distance. And we know what happened that night, he denied his Lord. And so unlike Peter, I want us to draw near. I don't want us to hold back. I want us to go into these narrative accounts. In some sense, I want us to to be there with Christ observing. I want us to experience and see his love, to feel his love. And I want us to worship him. And even those of you that are at home, I know maybe maybe it's hard, but, but even there in your homes for us to worship him together as our hearts are moved again. So it's Thursday night. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is on trial. Fingers point, voices whisper, witnesses fabricate, crowds unite, truth is denied, and hatred seethes, and the judge of all the earth stands accused. His sovereignty is veiled, his character is maligned, his authority is questioned, his divinity is ridiculed, And we're going to see that in the space of the next few hours, Christ is going to be passed around from one hungry wolf to the next as each takes its bite of their prey. And so I want you to take a look at this chart. Maybe you haven't noticed this before, just the whole ordeal of the trials. This is the sequence of trials. Jesus is gonna be taken first to Annas, who's the retired high priest. From there, he'll be taken from Annas to his son-in-law, Caiaphas, the current reigning high priest. From there, the Sanhedrin's gonna have to get a quorum together early in the morning so that they can rubber stamp this decision and then send Jesus to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, who's gonna pass the buck to Herod and Herod's gonna take a look at Christ and say, well, let me send him back to Pontius Pilate. And so we're gonna see six trials Three religious, three Roman, culminating in Jesus' death on the cross. And so this morning we're gonna look at just the religious trials and next week the Roman trials. So the religious leaders have been trying to get rid of Christ for quite some time. He's a threat to this religious empire that they've built. And we read in Mark chapter 14, by way of background, now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. The Garden of Gethsemane was that perfect opportunity. Judas knew this is where Christ loves to go with the disciples to get away from the crowds. This is the perfect place. If they were worried about people rioting and they arrested Jesus when the crowds were there, it it, it wasn't gonna work out. And so this was the place. And we know that in Gethsemane, Christ begins to face the horrors of what's to come in the next 24 hours. And he's there on his face in the garden praying to his father, but we know that he comes out of the garden on the other side, ready and willing to lay down his life. Because in a sense, he looked into the future and he saw you. And he saw those of you that are watching online this morning. And he saw each of us. And he was determined to go to the cross because of his love, ready to lay down his life for the sheep. And so amidst the snores of disciples asleep, A crowd of Roman soldiers and a crowd of religious officials arrives to arrest Jesus and no doubt they decided that the best uh, port of call was to send Judas out front. You know, they're coming with their lanterns and the chains and the things that they're gonna arrest Jesus and the disciples. So let's put Judas out front and maybe armed with a kiss, he will disarm Jesus and stun them and confuse them. Maybe, what is, that's, what, 
And there's Judas out front, plants that kiss on Christ. But Jesus is not planning on running. Jesus knows what's about to happen and he says to Judas, he looks him in the eye and says, friend, do what you came for. And our Lord knows. He's the one that's truly in control this night. But he knows that he has to face this trial alone. And as much as you and I might want to take the Lord's place tonight, as much as we might want to comfort him and defend him, he will go forward defenseless. Even his father will abandon him. Because he must be sacrificed as your substitute. You can't take his place. And we're going to see twisted judgment in a kangaroo court. If this is the trial of history, man versus God. But Jesus knows that behind that human fabric lies a greater battle, the battle of good versus evil. Now perhaps this is a question you've asked yourself at times, and I know people have asked it of me, and as I've faced difficult things in life, I've asked this question. If God is good, and if God is powerful, and if God is loving, then why doesn't God stamp out evil in the world? Well, if you've ever asked that question, can I just point you to Jesus on trial? Here's Jesus, the judge of right, righteousness, willingly surrendering himself, and he's allowing evil to win, so it seems. And it seems as though evil has won even for a moment, but it's only for a moment because he is busy accomplishing history's greatest good. And that should be a paradigm for us. We have a present paradigm, and so we see evil is still here, but God is working all things for good. And so it only seems as though God is silent in the face of evil. But if we put on the right lens, we'll see that evil doesn't have the last word. God does. So the gospel writers tell us they seized Jesus, they took him, they arrested him, they led him away, they bound him, they brought him, they handed him over. The God of the universe is bound. Infinity is held by the fibers of metal string. The one who sustains everything by his powerful word and by his powerful hand is about to have those hands tied behind his back. By those he can just snuff out with a blast from the breath of his nostrils, those whose lifespan is but a vapor. But I want you to see Jesus' hands are willingly surrendered. Nobody takes his life from him. He lays it down of his own accord and he's about to be crushed under the weight of your sin and mine. So let's look at trial number one, Jesus before Annas. Annas, and this is in John chapter 18. You might wanna turn there if you've got the scriptures. The verses will be up on the screen for those of you that are at home. They should be a lot clearer maybe than for those of you that are here in the auditorium. So you may wanna get out your Bibles or your phones and open to John chapter 18. And we're gonna make our way through the narrative as we look at Jesus before Annas. Let's read from verse 12. Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. So who's this Annas? Annas was officially retired as high priest, and it used to be that the high priest office was a term that ran for life, but when the Romans took over and Judea became a Roman province, understandably the Romans said, no, we don't want this position wielding too much influence and so we're scrapping this life term and we will de depose of the high priests as and when we feel it's necessary. And so Annas was replaced by his son-in-law, Caiaphas. And I smell a rat here because Caiaphas must have done something to really impress the Romans that they kept him in office for 19 years. He was still a high priest when Pilate became Roman governor. But that's not all. So we've got Annas and we've got Annas' son-in-law. That's not all. All five of Annas' sons became high priest over the next five decades. It seems that old man Annas, even though he was supposedly retired, and you will see in the scriptures that sometimes he's still called the high priest because he probably thought he was, and maybe some of the people did too, but he was definitely still pulling the strings. And it made me think, some people won't willingly step away. 
Some people won't willingly retire. They, they can't take a break. They can't let go of their control. And, and this is Annas. He wants a finger in every pie, even though he's supposedly retired. People like that have their identity in needing to be needed. And it's hard. It's a, it's a process. But we've got to be careful that we never believe that we are indispensable. We're just one part of God's God's sort of puzzle piece that he's using and he can choose to use others. We're never indispensable. And so that's a picture of Annas, but it could easily be a picture of us. But I want you to see Jesus. He has relinquished that control. He's opened his hands and he's relinquished control to his father. And as Peter, who's about to deny, will later say in his epistle, he says, Jesus has entrusted himself to him who judges justly. So Annas won't get out of the way. He's blocking Jesus. And it's worth reflecting whether at times we don't block Jesus. His claws are stuck deep into the family business and he wants the name of Jesus snuffed out. He's a threat. I was reminded of what one old missionary once said. Preach, die, be forgotten. Preach, die, be forgotten. But not Annas. We wouldn't even know his name if it wasn't for Jesus. You'd have been forgotten in history. But every true lover of Christ says, let all the Annas's fade away. Let all the other names fade away. Even let my own name fade away except the name of Jesus. So here's a question for those of us here and those of us watching this morning. What do you think the secret was of this family's power that they could retain the role of high priest for like pretty much half a century? Why do you think that was? I think the answer is their wealth. Their wealth. Money talks. In a corrupt world, money talks. Josephus, who was a Jewish historian who lived at this exact time, this is what he wrote in his history book. He said, Annas was a great hoarder of money. That's the Josephus' words about Annas, the retired high priest. So I think there's some who are like Annas who won't willingly let go of their power, but they also won't willingly let go of their money. And they'll go to the grave with their fists clenched, holding on to all these things that don't last until at the very last death has to pull open their palms and and wrench all of that away. Annas and his boys had control of the temple income. One British author Uh, basically calculated what the high priest's annual salary was if we convert it to present day values. Do you want to know what his annual salary was? Sit back. 9.8 million British pounds. 9.8 million British pounds. And this author was writing even a couple of years ago, so that figure would be much bigger with inflation today. And that doesn't even include the money that they got from the, the money changes in the temple, Those money changes would charge 12.5% commission, so coming for Passover, you want to buy some animals, you convert the money, they take in a 12.5% cut that goes to Annas and the family. Each animal that was to be inspected, there's a levy charge for that. And if you couldn't bring an animal with you, then you went to what was called the bazaars of the sons of Annas and bought your animals there. And at Passover, prices were hiked, they were exorbitant, It was a money-making racket. No wonder Jesus went into the temple courts and looked around and turned over the tables of the money changers and turned over the tables of those selling doves, doves that were supposed to be cheap for a pair of two doves. I read that some rabbi had to drop the price by 99% because he felt so bad, these exorbitant prices that were being charged. Look at Luke chapter 19 and what Luke tells us happened and what Jesus said when he went into the temple. Luke 19, 46. It is written, Jesus said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day, Jesus was teaching at the temple, Luke says, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. Jesus was a threat to the Annas family business. And when he turned over the tables in the temple, do you know what he was doing? He was putting his finger on their idol. That's what he was touching. When he touched those tables, he was touching the thing that they held dear, their back pocket. 
money, power, popularity, when mixed together with religion, is one of the most poisonous concoctions. And we see it in Jesus' day. We see it in church history if we look in the medieval period. And we see it in our own city. There's not something out there. We see the same in our city today, the health, wealth, prosperity gospel. Do you know that I was chatting to a church leader just this past week on Wednesday? A leader who's been fired from their church because they refused to play the numbers game. The leadership began to care about how can you get us more bums on the seats? And this leader was concerned about the poor and reaching out beyond the four walls of the church and in their opinion wasn't building the empire enough. And so this church called in their staff and changed policies and got them to sign on the dotted line that their income would now be based on the number of people that they baptized each year, the number of members they could get to sign up, the amount of money they were bringing in. Imagine what that does to staff culture when we already live in Johannesburg. This is a church in our city and we live in a culture of greed. Truth gets compromised. That's what's gonna happen. If if those people are are greedy and not truly serving God, what's gonna happen? You're gonna compromise. You're gonna make sales in salvation. The gospel's gonna get shortchanged for commission on counterfeit conversions. And so I say, as it was here, religion And money is still an intoxicating cocktail for those drunk on greed. And there's many in our land taken in by religion and money. But I want you to watch what happens when Jesus puts his finger on your idol. If you want to know if something is really an idol in your life, I want to ask you to look what happens when it's taken away. Look what happens when it's confronted Look what happens when your idol is tampered with. Tim Keller, that pastor in New York City, says, idols give us a sense of being in control. And we can locate our idols by looking at our nightmares. What do we fear the most? What if we lost it would make life not worth living? Keller says an idol is something we cannot live without. We must have it and therefore drives us to break rules we once honored, to harm others and even ourselves in order to get it. Idols are spiritual addictions that lead to terrible evil. And we're gonna see Annas and Caiaphas are gonna break the very rules that they claim to uphold, the rules that they say others must honor. And their spiritual addiction to money and power and popularity is going to lead to the most unimaginable evil. So let's continue. John chapter 18. Let's read verse 19. Meanwhile, the high priest, and again, that's referring to Anna, so it shows you kind of how they still saw him as the high priest. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about two things, about his disciples and his teaching. Now, this isn't an official trial. It's more like a kind of a, let's shake you up a little bit before the trial, a kind of a a, a police interrogation gone wrong. And I think Annas is gloating. Finally, he's got Jesus in front of him and he wants to dig up some dirt. He wants to ask Jesus all these questions and then he wants to feed that dirt onto his son-in-law who can get rid of him. And as a bonus, if he can extract information about the disciples, I mean, the whole arrest had been bungled, the disciples had run away, Maybe he's hoping he can get some dirt on where they are. and Maybe he asks about the disciples to gauge how popular Jesus is. Maybe he playing, is playing the numbers game. So tell me about your numbers. How's it going there? How large is your following? And I think we must be very, very careful of judging ministry success on numbers alone. On numbers alone. Because right at this moment, Peter is out in the courtyard. And if you to read John's account in full, you'll see it's kind of like a a movie scene because it switches between Jesus and the interrogation back to Peter. Jesus and the interrogation back to Peter. And that's what John is doing. He's trying to show us a contrast of Jesus who's standing firm in truth and Peter who's failing. So at this point, Jesus' disciples are nowhere. The numbers game looks, doesn't look too good. There's, There's only one left and it's Jesus and he's about to be snuffed out. And so if we're gonna play the Annas game, we'd have to say, Jesus, your ministry is a failure. But there stands Jesus, faithful. So maybe ministry success has more to do with faithfulness than numbers. 
And then Anna switches gears. And now he doesn't just want to know about the disciples. He wants to know about Jesus' teaching. Maybe he's hoping to trap him. Maybe he, he has this thought that Jesus is this clandestine figure who's been teaching all this revolutionary stuff. And look what Jesus replies in verse 20. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Jesus is reminding Annas in these last few days, I've been teaching in the temple right here in front of you, almost under your authority. You can ask people. But Annas, no doubt, perceives Jesus' teaching as secret because he doesn't understand it. He has his mind darkened with unbelief. He's blind. And so he thinks it's secret. And, but it's Annas' motives that are cloaked. It's Annas whose methods are sinister. It's Annas who's projecting his own modus operandi onto Jesus and he's saying, well, actually I really know that I act in an underhanded way when I want power. So everybody else in the world, including Jesus, must act that way. And so Jesus replies in verse 21. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. Jesus knows that without witnesses, this trial is a farce. Annas and Caiaphas were used to controlling people with their money and with their power. I think they've paid Judas already 30 pieces of silver. They've paid the false witnesses who we're about to see. And then I think, I don't have absolute proof, but I think they must have lined Pilate's pockets. How on earth do you get Roman soldiers to come to the Garden of Gethsemane? That doesn't happen without money. How do you get Roman soldiers to guard a dead man's tomb on Easter Sunday with money? And then you use your money, the scriptures tell us, to convince those gods to lie about what really happened on Resurrection Sunday. But that's what I love about Jesus. He can't be bought. Integrity doesn't have a price, and he's so composed. Because it was expected in these Jewish courts that you would grovel and that you would take a servile, bent-down attitude and just grovel in the dirt for mercy. But Jesus is not going to play games with these religious leaders. And so he stands there. He doesn't want to avoid this road of suffering. He's not going to dance to their tune of manipulation. He just calmly points to the lack of incriminating witnesses. And we read in verse 22 of John 18 that when Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? The voice of truth is slapped in the face. And Jesus responds in verse 23. If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why do you strike me? And then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Jesus won't let this twisting of the Sanhedrin law go unnoticed. He wants to let Annas know, I, I, I notice what's going on here. Because if I spoke untruthfully, then produce the witnesses. And if there aren't any witnesses, then why did you slap me? And so Annas has reached an impasse. And so he sends Jesus hands bound to his son-in-law, Caiaphas. But brothers and sisters, I want you to know Jesus isn't bound by his hands. He's bound by his heart. He's bound by his love, the love that he has for you and for me. That's what's binding him. He, need, he knows he needs to go this way in order to save you. And so my prayer is that you will allow these truths to impact you this Easter, that you'd be moved again to see how much you are loved and in return that you'd worship Christ. Because if you don't, you're gonna be like Annas. You're gonna push Christ away. You're gonna ignore his word. You're gonna ignore his presence. You're gonna ignore those sweet times of prayer. You're gonna ignore his character and his identity. Why? Because you're afraid of him meddling in your life, of him putting his finger on your idols and your sin. So let's come to trial number two. Jesus now before Caiaphas. So let's switch over to the Gospel of Matthew. We've been in John chapter 18, now in Matthew chapter 26 from verse 57. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas the high priest where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. 
Scholars believe that Annas and Caiaphas probably lived in the same palace, so Jesus was taken from one room in the palace to perhaps another wing where Caiaphas was. And during all this time, Caiaphas has been scurrying around to, to try and organize the Sanhedrin so they can get a quorum. I don't think they had Sanhedrin WhatsApp groups in those days, so I don't know how he got the word out late at night to try and gather people. Because Judas had suddenly appeared. They weren't gonna do anything at this season in case people rioted, but Judas has rocked up. There's a sudden game changer. They've got to put these cogs in motion, and all this has to happen so soon. Because Bruce Milne says if Jesus' execution was to be carried through, they had to have him tried and formally condemned by the Sanhedrin by early on the Friday. Then get Pilate's confirmation by mid to late morning so that he could be on the cross by midday, dead and off the cross again before sundown inaugurated the Sabbath. It's like we've got Passover, we've got Sabbath coming, let's just get everything done and dusted, we've got to just move on with our lives. And it seems if we piece together the gospel accounts that at this point they didn't have a quorum. And some of the gospel writers talk about at daybreak or early in the morning, they then had to gather again to rubber stamp this decision that they're now about to make. Sanhedrin was a body of 71 men, 70 plus the high priest, comprising Pharisees, Sadducees, the religious leaders of the day, and they were the supreme court of Judaism. But there's a really, really fascinating passage back in John chapter 11. And we can see that Caiaphas has already made up his mind as to the verdict, so we can really see this court case are gonna go wrong. All the way back in John 11, when Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead and crowds were believing in Christ, already then Caiaphas had made up his mind as to what to do with Jesus. So look at John chapter 11 from verse 47. So after Lazarus has been raised to life, the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. And then one of them, named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied. He didn't even realize he was making a, a prophecy, but he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God, to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. So from Caiaphas' point of view, Jesus is expendable. Let's just get the job done. Uh, do we want you know, the family empire? Do we want the whole Jewish nation? Do we want all that we've built to fall away? Well, it's more expendable just to have one man die for the people. And he doesn't realize that's actually the plan of God, to have Jesus as our substitute. But Caiaphas is gonna bend and break whatever laws are there to get the job done. One author I read said, over 20 different illegalities took place, and I can't go into all of those, but let me just give you four before the trials even started. It was illegal for a decision of guilt to be made before a trial began. It was illegal for a capital trial to be held at night, and they're meeting at night. It was illegal for Caiaphas to convene the court in his home. It was illegal for the court to sit on the eve of a holy day, and another whole string of things that went wrong in the case itself but they need to keep up the charade of justice, so they call in their witnesses. Look at verse 59 of Matthew 26. The chief priests, the whole Sanhedrin, looking for false evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Though many false witnesses came forward. Mark even tells us their statements didn't agree, and that's what you needed. You needed at least two witnesses for the case to even go ahead. So you had to have one independent witness come in, testify, leave the room. Number two came in, and it was the point of Jewish law was to absolutely interrogate the witnesses, not the accused. In fact, the accused couldn't even be condemned by his own testimony. It was all around the agreement of two witnesses. So I want you to see this. What is that, Phil? This puppet show. It really is a puppet show of bribed witnesses. And it's falling apart. And if you look carefully, there's this kind of this curtain in front of this puppet show and it's, it's falling off. 
And we can look through this flimsy facade and we can see the strings, we can see the puppeteers, we can see the uh, manipulated mouths and the, the gloves that are controlling people. And then finally in verse 60, and it's almost as if maybe Caiaphas put that finally in there. Because we read, finally two came forward, two witnesses came forward and declared, this fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. And I imagine Caiaphas breathing a, a, a sigh of relief. Finally, we've got the evidence we're looking for. What insurrectionist this man must be to, to say he's gonna destroy the most holiest of temples. And yes, their testimony does sound like something Jesus did say, but Jesus was referring to his body as the temple. He said, this temple will be destroyed and it will be raised to life in three days. But you know what Mark tells us? That even as these two witnesses came in, Mark tells us even their testimony did not agree. As they were interrogated, the stories didn't add up. Did he really say that or say this? And so what now? There doesn't seem to be a case. Jesus is slipping through Caiaphas' fingers, so what is he gonna do? To save face, he begins to question Jesus directly. Another illegality. He's got no witnesses, so you can't make Jesus the witness. So look at verse 62. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? And Matthew tells us in verse 63. But Jesus remained silent. Jesus was quite within his legal rights not to answer. Caiaphas was breaking the rules by interrogating him directly. They couldn't use what Jesus said to formulate the case and then themselves be witnesses at the very same trial. And so I look at Jesus' silence and I say how eloquent silence can be. He doesn't defend what doesn't need to be defended. Like a lamb before its shearers is silent, Jesus is silent before a higher tribunal, a greater court, the court of heaven, the court before his father. That's who he's ultimately silent before because he knows he's about to have the iniquity of us all laid on him. And if you want to know why Jesus is so composed, it's because he loves you. It's his love for you that constrained him and composed him because he knew for the joy set before him, the joy of you being in relationship with him. I think Caiaphas is embarrassed. He's got egg on his face, and so now he has no other choice but to up the ante. Jesus is not responding, and so he invokes this charge, and we read in verse 63, the high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus replies, you have said so. I don't believe Jesus is being evasive here because Mark's gospel tells us how clear Jesus was and adds to this account. I think Jesus is responding and almost saying that in the same breath as I've answered this, I'm forcing you, my question, Caiaphas, to take ownership of what you've just uttered. You have said so. It's not that I don't agree, I do agree, but you have said this. This is in your words, these are the words you've used. You've uttered this with your own lips and if you don't believe what you've uttered, you will be damned. But Jesus doesn't leave his answer open to ambiguity and he cries out in verse 64. But I say to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Referring back to the book of Daniel, he points to his divinity and supremacy even over these proceedings. And look what happens. Verse 65. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, he has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Caiaphas rips his clothes. The high priest wasn't even allowed to rip his clothes if his own spouse passed away. So I'm guessing this was one massive, big, dramatic effect. If you know anything about an illusionist, it's all about misdirection. Look here, and that's what he's doing. He wants them to look here at Jesus instead of all the illegalities he's committed to even get us to this point. And he wants to just hurry things along by putting the spotlight on Jesus. We don't need any more witnesses. We're in a hurry. We, we don't have time. Let's just get the show on the road. Blasphemy. 
But the irony is that in all of this, it's not Christ who's committed blasphemy, it's Caiaphas. God himself is staring him in the face and he's condemning God to die. He's got a hold of God and he's strangling God. Caiaphas is the one who's blaspheming by condemning the Son of God to die. And I think it's true to say that cruelty always follows injustice. Because look at these horrible words in verse 67. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you? And I read this and I say, what kind of court would flout all of their own laws? What kind of court would even tolerate this kind of behavior? And then I say to myself, this is not just any court, this is a religious court. These are supposedly religious people. This is the cream of the religious crop. This is the Pharisees and the Sadducees, those that claim that they got it all together, the most moral, obeying the minute little laws that they've made up. They're the ones. But perhaps as we gaze upon this terrible scene, we should rather ask, what kind of love endures this? What kind of love would endure this? What kind of grace is it that would endure this spit? Is the love of God for you that deep? For those of you that are here in person this morning, is the love of God for you that deep? And for those of you watching online, is the love of God for you really that deep that it would endure spit? It is. It's astounding. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I don't know why this is, but I think sometimes the hardest people to reach are religious people. And they can be in this room this morning, they can be watching online, they can even be standing behind this pulpit. Because they're so busy building their religious ministry, so busy with their performance, so busy looking back and saying, oh, look how well I'm doing religiously and I'm so glad I'm better than them and, and, and not recognizing Christ in front of us whose death actually pays the price. Religious people who think they're worshiping God because of their performance when in fact they're crucifying him. What a tragic thing to even think about. And so there's one final thing as we close for Caiaphas and the religious leaders to do. They know they don't have any legal jurisdiction to execute anyone. So they meet once again early in the morning with a quorum at daybreak just to get the final technicalities done and they probably met at the hall of hewn stone near the temple for trial number three before the Sanhedrin. It's just a mere formality. The Bible doesn't really tell us too much about it. Matthew just says in verses one and two of chapter 27, that early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans how to have Jesus executed. So they bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. But as we close this morning, perhaps all is not as it seems. Perhaps this morning it's not really Jesus on trial. Maybe it's you on trial, and me, and sinful humanity. Maybe in a manner of speaking, the tables have turned. Because the Apostle John wrote early in the gospel at the start of Christ's ministry in John chapter three about what the real verdict is on this Thursday night, early Good Friday morning. This is what John writes. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed, but whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. Let's forget about Annas and Caiaphas for a moment and let's put ourselves in that courtroom. Let's see ourselves on trial. What are you afraid of today in terms of what will be exposed if you walk into the light? What's the idol that you're holding onto with clenched fists that you don't want to let go? What's that sin? What's that addiction? Will you come again at this Easter time and just surrender in fresh repentance and faith? Enjoy a relationship with Christ and just be honest with yourself. You can't even keep your own man-made rules. You keep bending them so that you 
at least can jump through your own hoops because you wouldn't be able to live with yourself. Never mind God's law that none of us can keep. What a burden to keep performing. That's why Jesus is in the courtroom. Because he loves you. He loves you even though, even as a Christian, you sometimes still love darkness. And if you don't come to Jesus this Easter again, if you don't come to worship and bow the knee, then your only other option, because you can't stay neutral, is to slap truth in the face and to push Jesus away. But if you push Jesus away, you'll be crucifying the only hope that there is to be saved this Easter. Won't you come? Let's pray together. Oh Lord Jesus, as we journey with you, our hearts are heavy in one sense, Lord. This is a heavy trial to walk through, but Lord, we just observe this. What, what was it like for you? We just thank you, Lord, for your love, a love that we've experienced nowhere else. I pray that our hearts would just be moved, that you would be willing to do all of this, that you, the God of truth, would allow yourself to be maligned and yet stay silent and willingly walk as that lamb to the slaughter. I pray that you would grip our hearts again this Easter that we would have open eyes and open hearts and open ears to hear what you want to say to us. Lord, may we see beauty even in what is evil unimaginable because we know the ending. We know that you're a God that works things together for the good of those that love you and nobody loved you more than your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So come and do a new work in us, we pray, as we journey with you. Amen. Thank you for listening to this sermon from Rosebank Union Church. If you've enjoyed this message, please feel free to share it with others. And if you would like to support the work of Rosebank Union Church, please visit the giving link on our website at ruc.org.za.